Hello and welcome everyone to the show. I'm so glad to introduce my guest today. He is Mr. Wim Winters. He is the host of the YouTube channel Authentic Sound. And um, he is very well known for his research in the area of uh, whole beat uh, theory. And uh, also he records, as uh, he does a lot of research on, and as is the, t the name of his title, of his YouTube channel is the authentic sound of how the recreation of the performance practice of music in what we call the classical music today, but historic music performance. And so, Wim, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, there's a lot to get into, and I hope and I hope we can really get dive into the technical details. Let's let's start with when did you start your YouTube channel? And there was a certain point where you, there was a shift from just performance practice and then you hit upon a concept that really kind of defined the trajectory of your channel for a number of years. That's a great starting question. So um, why did I start a YouTube channel? You know, when I got my clavichord back in, I think, 2009, it was for me like, you know, I'm trained as an organist and pianist and then it's a long story how I came to the clavichord, but finally that instrument was there. It was like an unbelievable experience for me to, I knew the instrument, but now it was at home and it was unbelievable. Was, I, I sometimes say it's like the sky was opening and the angels were singing. The <laughs> clavichord is just a magical instrument. And so I started to promote that together with my wife, Anya. So, so we had quite a successful few seasons where we played a lot of concerts on clavichord. And then, you know, you are practicing, you're playing music and... I don't know if, if many of the listeners perhaps will know the feeling or recognize that, but there, is a, there are moments when you are a musician, as a musician, play an instrument alone, solo, and you end the piece, and there's just this magical feeling of like, oh, you know, that's why we do it. And right. so I was sitting there alone. <laughs> Nobody was witnessing what happened. What year and was so this? I, I that was like 2012, 2013, okay. and then suddenly I I said like, listen, I should actually record this, and I started experimenting with like either field microphone a recorder, like a little Tascam device, and a few old microphones, and YouTube. I mean, we today see YouTube as it's it's everywhere, right? But even in 2014, there was still early on in the YouTube days. I mean, 2006, then you are a pioneer on yep. YouTube. 2013, everything everything changed on YouTube. And 2014, when I started uploading my first video, was still like, you know, it's just a platform where you share your recordings. Yep. And so I shared those clavichord recordings at the beginning. And then like, if, you, if you go back on the channel, I mean, do that. And if you want to enjoy yourself, like how bad <laughs> it was recorded and... But it was what it was, and it felt great. And so from there, I found, for there, from, from there on, everything developed. Uh, some, uh, even there were people com commenting on the on the recordings I uploaded. It was well, a complete surprise to me. Like I was building a library of content, but I wasn't suspect suspecting anyone to come there. You know. Yeah. And so there, the, the YouTube journey started, and everything else developed like it is today. The clavichord, just so people know, I'm going to just share this screen here. So the clavichord is this this instrument here, um, and so. But you're you said you're a, you're an organist and a, a harpsichordist. Is that right? No, actually, I'm. I do not play the harpsichord uh, often. Well, you could say it's an 18th century term. Is keyboard player? Keyboard. Okay. So 18th century musicians played the organ, the harpsichord, the or the piano, the early ones, and the clavichord. But one profession. Right. And, and I, I do know that one of my partimento teachers told me about the well-tempered clavier is perhaps this was a very much 
was it used for organists to practice at home because it had more of a touch than the harpsichord did? It's a very interesting question. So <laughs> today, generally, from an organ perspective, but I think also from many people who are into keyboards, that the clavichord is still seen as a practicing instrument connected to the organist. And it was okay. true, eh? certainly in the 17th century, but still in the 18th century, the clavichord, oftentimes when a new organ was built, the organ builder built uh, also made a clavichord with the same keyboard, so the organist could practice at home. Because remember, in the days, we didn't have an electrical blower, you know? People had to really <laughs> manually right. feed the organ with wind, and so it was very expensive. But in the 18th century, early on, actually late eight, late 17th century in the environment of Pachelbel, which is very interesting, the clavichord became an independent instrument. It became from a smaller instrument to what we would say an unfretted instrument, where every key actually has its own pair of strings. And why was that done? Because in the early 18th century, composers, especially I would say in, 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 in German-speaking countries, were looking for this expression, expression like the flute traver, and the clavichord. So we can actually imitate the voice or a violin player. And there was the clavichord uh, born as Bach knew it and later Mozart and Haydn and even Beethoven. And that's the type of instrument I'm playing. Just to really, um, to just to follow up on that, who used the, harp, the, the clavichord in the 18th century? Did Haydn use it? Did Mozart use it? Did CPE Bach use it? Who, who used it? Basically, every composer. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> if you want to give you one example, for instance, Mozart, Mozart's father as well. They they, they had they had um, uh, a big hall where clavichords were like sold. They had really a shop. They were sellers of clavichords, and so there is even uh, letters between Wolfgang and his father about the clavichord that he saw and how much it should cost and things like that. But even Beethoven, when he was in. Uh, in, in, in Bonn still, he had lessons from Neve. So Neve was the second generation, you could say, of third, gener third generation of Bach student, uh, so in this line. But there, Neve had the Friedrich Klavichord, and Beethoven learned the entire world temple the clavier there. So <laughs> wow. we, I guess he played on the clavier. When Beethoven left Bonn for Vienna, Count von Waldstein, very famous name, right? He yep. gave him a clavichord as a feral gift. Wow. It's a beautiful instrument. Is and it is heavy? Thing, is it like something? Uh, can you carry that was it? A travel. Yeah, a clavichord in general, yes. Even my instrument, which is a big Saxon clavichord, it's 40 kilos. So okay, you need wow. two persons yeah, yeah. or one very strong person. <laughs> <Right>. possible. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, uh, the, so the clavichord has two functions. I had, it, was a, it was in one hand in the 18th century, even in the early 19th century, a cheaper instrument to make. So yep. a lot of people had it. But on the other hand, it was also an exclusive instrument. It was very expensive. The very good clavichords were very sought. Even Mendelssohn wanted to ha had a clavichord, had a really? Silberman clavichord in wow. the working room. Yeah, okay. I was proud on that. Wow. Mozart wanted to buy a Silberman. So the great builder Silberman, who was contemporary of Bach, wanted to build, buy a uh, Silberman clavichord at the end of his life. He didn't get it. It wasn't lively. Wow. Probably maybe even box instrument. We don't know that. So the, the clavichord, when you dive into that, was a very lively culture of, uh, of, of, of you know, playing and performing. And, and, and But in the 18th century, you know, everything was, there was not something specifically composed for harpsichord or specifically composed for clavichord, even organ music. If you would ask me, what are the organ works of Bach? You would end up like in a big gray zone. For right. instance, the well-tempered keyboard. Yeah, you can play it on the organ too. It sounds yeah. magnificent. Yeah. So, um, does it change the way that you? Because it was new for you at the time when you you picked it up. Did it change the way you played organ? Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it, it changed everything. Um, I have to say though that my teacher in Amsterdam, Jacques van Noordmessen, he was. But, but in hindsight, you know, when you look back on that, he passed away in 2015. His technique that he uh, that he learned me was very close to what you needed for the clavichord. So oftentimes, when people, musicians, organists, harpsichord players, pianists go on the clavichord, at first it's a very difficult instrument because you have to control the touch, the tension. So there is a little um, a steel thing, you know, that hits hits the the string. You have to really control that because it needs to be there, needs to stay there, and so. 
I didn't have much trouble in that, but my touch developed there so much that, <laughs> funny story, one of the last uh, concerts I actually played with Shaq uh, was in 2013, I think. We, I played the clavichord and he played the organ. It's on YouTube, it's on my YouTube channel, you can check it out. We were practicing and you know, there is always this teacher-student relationship, it, it remains, you know. Yeah. And we were playing like a duet, like you're playing Mozart, um, I don't know, the Kleine Nachtmusik, I think, in forehand. And he said, you know what, your touch, your touch I mean, the touch of the organ evolved to a uh, uh, much better touch. So I said, yes, probably the clavichord. He said, yeah, I guess so. So <laughs> he could hear that. It, it's the mother of the keyboard instruments. So actually, Ed, every keyboard player should have a clavichord. Really? That's okay. Yeah. Wow, wow. And the 18th century was considered like that. Immanuel Bach wrote in his book, on keyboard playing, um, a, a true keyboard. So a very the ex, the, excellent, the, the, the the best keyboard players can be actually um, uh, uh, how do you say that um, tested on the clavichord only. And, and why, clavichord why is that? What is the touch like? Is it a lighter touch, or 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 yeah. how does it change the way? Because I know there's sensitivity to it that other like the harpsichord does not have. So in a harpsichord, you really plug the string and yeah. then you have the sound that actually is in the instrument. You can influence it a little bit and you have different registers, so different colors that you can add. But on the clavichord, you have the possibility to go from very, 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 very soft to moderately loud. But in right. between that, everything. So I even think, if I'm not mistaken, that was C.P.E. Bach who sometimes writes triple piano. So <laughs> and the great thing is that the you are so close to the strings. You feel the strings. It's like a violin player. Once you have that in your fingers, you miss it everywhere. When I first got my, my, my forte piano in 2019, I texted to Joris Potflieger, the builder of my clavichord and of the forte piano. I said, like, it's like, it feels like your fingers are just cut <laughs> off, you know. It, it, it's so hard. I'm not hard in the terms of difficult, but it's so, it doesn't feel right. I miss this aftertouch that you have in the clavichord. It's hard to explain, right. but uh, that, that's part of the, the problem of the challenge as well. Eh? But it's also when you control that, what you actually control is the attack. The, you have to hold the note perfectly, so you have to control the weight of your arm, relax, and then the release of the key. And you need that on the organ. And the harpsichord in a way as well. You will hear the difference when the harpsichord player is going to practice on the clavichord more. The touch changes. E Emmanuel Bach actually describes that. It's unbelievable. It's fascinating. Does the piano, is the piano able to serve that function? In the since Because they didn't have pianos back then, CPE. I guess uh, Bach, the JS Bach time, he didn't like the pianos that were available. Does the modern piano somewhat have that kind of um, I don't want to say replace because the clavichord is still very popular. Um, but how, how, are they, how are they different, the piano and the clavichord, in terms of that training, that touch for the organ, yeah. I guess? Yeah. Yeah. It influences your touch on the other, on the other keyboard instruments for sure, also on the piano. The piano, of course, the forte piano uh, evolved from the clavichord. Sometimes people say, and you hear that a lot, like the harpsichord was there until a certain moment, and then the piano came. Just the clavichord overlapped that. <laughs> right, right. The, the clavichord went, I mean, even Scandinavia and Sweden, clavichords were, were built until in the 1840s, eh, with six octaves, steel strings. Unbelievable. We don't right. know actually exactly what they played on that. Yeah. But the piano, of course, serves served one purpose, that is the possibility of playing louder and softer. And it had also more sound outputs, more decibels. The early piano fortes did not have that much more sound output compared to the clavichord. Of course, the Steinway is much louder. So you still have you have one aspect of the clavichord that's developed into that way. But the main difference is on the clavichord, you touch a string and you keep it there. Your finger is directly responsible for what happens. On the forte piano, on the modern piano, you throw a hammer at the string. So there's a certain point where you have to say goodbye to what ex actually your expression is. And there, the last centimeters are actually is a, is a travel journey of a hammer with an enormous speed that is an acceleration that 
it's a magnification actually of what your touch was, but on the clever court it's one on one. Ah, it's very addictive. Right. It's very addictive. Also have that addictive. feeling. Addictive. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Oh, I've got, now. Yeah. So by the way, that Bach didn't like the, the piano forte is not entirely true. Eh? Uh -huh. So his comments on Silberman were from techni in technical respect. He didn't like the way it responded already. It was mm. very early on. And I think that's because he expected to have a clavichord. He missed that. I mean, mm. when you have this direct control, you want to have it in that kind of instrument as well. That's very so, interesting that 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 it's the the clavichord is it's 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 closer to your fingers and the actual sound that you want to make whereas the piano is there's that little gap there. That's in, that's yeah, very interesting. Exactly. That's very interesting. Um so uh authentic sound is the th general theme of the channel. So was there a point now let's go back to the story. So you've introduced the clavichord, you've recorded a couple of recordings. How did the journey continue from there? That's also an interesting question, a very dangerous question. <laughs> so I was just playing on the clavichord and making uploads on YouTube. And of course, there comes a moment where you think, OK, I'm building a library. People are asking questions. Tune in. And there comes a moment where and every YouTuber, every YouTube creator will feel have that same feeling once that you feel a responsibility. Right. You share things. And certainly, you know, we are in, I'm saying we as musicians are in this hip movement, if you want it or not. So we are supposed to know what we are doing, which is, I mean, the disclaimer, spoiler alert, we we only partly know what we are doing. I mean, there is a it's lot a of reconstruction, right? It's a reconstruction. So there's going to be questions. That's the aim of the entire movement. But of course, there is a lot. And now we're going to talk about that, of course, I think right. in, 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 in a few minutes. But there is a lot where you enter an area where, you know, we, we don't have recordings of Bach. Yeah? We don't have no. recordings of Mozart. So there is kind of interesting, I would say, speculation. Right. But, you know, people ask questions and I wanted to reply in the best way I could. And also... I was I was playing not only Bach anymore, but also uh, Mozart and early Beethoven. And then people said, yeah, but you're playing it so much slower. And you see, there came a point where I thought, okay, am I going to be serious about this or really diving into this? Because I, I tended to play everything a little bit slower because yeah. I came from the 18th century. I had this connection with Bach. Very few musicians have play Bach, I would say on a professional level, and go to Beethoven. There is like this, this little gap there. Eh? You play right. either Bach and before, or you play Mozart and after, and <laughs> this connection was too strong. Right. And so there slowly developed, uh, you know, this this wish or this, uh, I, would, I would say, this, this, this feeling of like, I have to take this more serious because I want to also be able to answer the questions to me. Yeah. I was looking for answers for myself. Yeah. No, and that's so, the same. I mean, the, I understand that completely because, I mean, the whole reason I have this show is for myself. It's for, really for my own benefit because I want to ask smart people what, what the deal is for a lot of things that I didn't know. Uh, it's funny yeah. you bring up the, the, the question of reconstruction because I've, on a, on a, as an analogy, I often wonder what would happen if 100 years from now we lost all our jazz recordings and we had to reconstruct jazz from anecdotes, from quotes, from from journalists, uh, maybe from sheet transcriptions. But we have no recordings. And I was thinking, like, wow, that would be tough because, like, the oral tradition is cut, and we have nothing left, and we just have to rely on quotes. And sometimes the quotes we don't really know the context, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult to come up with perhaps a a, and a very firm answer. We can try our best. And so into this minefield we walk now. So, um, and so it's I, a very, very interesting analogy. I mean, yeah. I've never thought about this. Like, that's a great example. Like, exactly answer the question: What would you do when you wake <laughs> up hundred years from now and all the jazz recordings have disappeared? How? Yeah. And you have only the notes. Yep. And then even notes, I, I guess, with without a lot of the improvisations that these jazz players actually added to that. How are you going to reconstruct that? So let's go back to your 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 story because your story is really interesting and uh, it it seems to have uh, really captured uh, it, people have really um, resonated with it. Um, some people have been very vocal against it. Some have been very vocal for it. Let's dive into it now. So, when did you 
come upon this theory? And what year was that? And uh, what was your initial reaction to it? And uh, how? Uh, let's start maybe there. So when we travel back in time to my time in Amsterdam, where my study time there at the conservatory, my teacher, Jacques van Oetmans, and again, he was enormously influence, influential to me. Right. Um, he was a great teacher. And he was one of those musicians that all, always questions himself. Like, I know that many musicians do that, but it's, it takes a lot of bravery in our domain of this historically informed performance practice to say to your students sometimes you know i don't know it i figure it out yeah and especially on the on on the issue of tempo research of tempo reconstruction he had very strong i wouldn't say opinions but he had strong understanding of notation which for me laid the foundation of everything i still am doing today and so i saw a huge um, the discrepancy since I also studied piano. I mean, I remember one day I came from the Walsekerk in Amsterdam, where is a beautiful Müller organ from 1737. I played the trio sonata of Bach, Allegro. And I went to the piano class in the afternoon. I played an Allegro for Mozart. And I was thinking, I know the moment I was unlocking my bike outside and say, wait a minute. There's something wrong. I suddenly realized, I feel still so stupid today, but many musicians will recognize this. I said, but Mozart, he was born six years after Bach died. There is no possibility that there was not such a kind of tradition. So when I play this Rio Sonata in, let's say, quarter note 72, there is no way that the same notation Allegro and Mozart's Allegro can be quarter note 128. I'm just making this piece number up. There is right, no right. way. And so I started asking questions to my teacher, Jacques Van Oetmesse. I started asking questions to my piano teacher, and that <laughs> was a dangerous path because they didn't have answers. Yeah. And then in 1992, I think, 1993, 1992, I was just a few years there, was, I don't know why, the, what, the, the school organized a tempo symposium. Oh, like, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they made one big mistake. They only invited the people um, that gathered around back in the day, still famous today, but for, uh, for those of you who are in this, Willem Retze Talsma. So Talsma is one of the first in 1980 who partly, we, 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 we are not copying him, we are actually also correcting him, but he introduced this kind of concept on a larger sc uh, scale. Mm -hmm. And he was there for the first time in 10 or 15 years back in the Netherlands. And so there I met some people, I talked to some people, and for me there was something like more than intriguing. I could smell, you know, from, from a distance, this was what my question with the, unlocking the bike. Right. That was the moment where I should have had these answers. And so from that moment on, there was this, 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 this thing uh, that started. It developed in, in, in a specific way, I would say. <laughs> The way so that was so this is quite early then it's actually well before the channel. Oh yeah, I'm I'm. So you're not somebody who who just stumbled upon something in around twenty as it twenty seventeen oh, no, and no, said no. and then suddenly everything changed. This has been something that's been percolating in your mind Almost for thirty for a, years now. Yeah, thirty yeah, years. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so from, from that moment, I kept in on speaking terms of, uh, I mean, one of the claimants from Glein, he passed away recently, he became a very good friend. But I have to say, like, this gave some answers to me playing that classical music a little bit slower. But remember, in those days, I didn't have a clavichord, I only played the organ. So in the organ world, this is not so much of a debate because organs do not allow this very high tempi right. in general, mm -hmm. not. And, but so fast forward, when I had the clever chord, uh, we talked about it earlier. I was starting just to a play quick Mozart. question: how yeah? how can the clever chord go very fast? In when you would take the definition of the um, naysayers, literally that lighter instruments allow faster playing, then the clever chord should be the fastest instrument of every instrument because it only has a, a key weight of twelve gram. Compare that to a Steinway fifty-two, uh, an Irar nineteenth-century piano forty-eight. 44, 48, a 40 piano is also th is still 38 grams. So the clavichord is by far the lightest instrument, but no, it's not possible. You okay. can play fast, 
but you cannot play like as on a piano fast like people play today that's not right. possible okay oh yeah but sorry go ahead it's, you were talking no, about no, yeah. it's a great question and, and you should interrupt me because i'm used to talk like forever <laughs> <laughs> so but the clever chord people and i say people like a general audience on youtube but also in real life when I played a concert, I played once a concert with three Beethoven sonatas on the clavichord, they loved it. And they didn't have this connection with mainstream performances, I would say, because they saw an instrument that they didn't know, and yep. certainly an instrument that they didn't know for that music. So when I played Beethoven's Pathetic Sonata much slower than you, they, they thought, okay, that's the instrument, we like it very much. Yeah. But there came, of course, a moment where I said to my wife, listen, I would like to go into the Beethoven world more, and then you need a fortepiano. Yeah. The clavichord has an end period, like from the moment that piano compositions are like Waldstein composition. I played the Waldstein first movement on the channel, but it's like people don't realize it's actually not possible anymore technically. Is I that because of the range? I mean, what is the range of the clavichord? It depends. Uh, the largest clavichords in the German style are five octaves but that's like but th th you have like less you have in the swedish later instrument six octaves but five octaves is like end of the 18th century kind of mm. standard okay. it's not only because of the range it's also because of the complexity of the chord so on a clavichord you need to have a perfect uh, transition from your finger into the key so for instance you cannot you cannot reach with your fifth finger to a note and play it like like this you know you have to go there you have to go in and get the note and and straight in okay <laughs> so this makes it complex even for Bach fugues eh? it's yeah. very well possible but your technique should be flawless because otherwise you hear pack tack tack it's like this 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 ugly sound but when the when for and certainly beethoven and those composers where chords become more complex you cannot do that anymore right. and so it becomes technically impossible to play it on the clever chord or very very complicated Right. And so I needed the forte piano, but I said to my wife, listen, when we are going to do that, people are not going to give me the benefit of the doubt anymore, because then I enter like a full hip world, you know, in an arena now of uh, gunslingers. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's maybe maybe a too harsh of a comparison, but, <laughs> but there is something there that I mean, we can speak about that, right? There's a certain kind of. Um arms race i mean of pianists and, and who who and, and uh, we can talk about that in in the reaction to the theory as it was as you were talking as you were yeah. discussing it but but there yeah go certainly, ahead. yeah go ahead there is Sorry. certainly there there is certainly an expectation but more so when and if people are listening now who are 40 piano players or musicians or early music musicians don't misquote me on this i mean i'm really um I try to be like as genuine as i can but Everybody knows the feeling that if you do something differently compared to what already exists mm. and what is common practice, then you cannot avoid that you give like the um, that you're actually saying you're wrong about what you are doing because I'm right, and that's so hard to overcome. Mm. And it's a pity because the early music movement in in music actually lives from experimentation or should live from experimentation right because which means, we don't know right i mean this is a big gray area in, in many ways for so many things exactly right. exactly so traveling back 200 years in time where your jazz players have no no uh, recordings <laughs> i mean we don't have them either yeah how can you expect that what we do based on feeling right, right. like our taste is magically aligning with what beethoven had in mind it's not possible it's interesting you know i i, I remember this is this is a, an interesting thing where i remember that for the longest time i would not listen to schumann because i read a quote by chopin that said that he basically said the carnival was not music and I said, oh, Chopin hates Schumann. I'm never listening to Schumann. It was so stupid. <laughs> was so st and I, I was young, you know, and I just, and I thought, and, then, and I realized I, I can't just say that because what's the context of the way that was said, you know? I mean, I, and it's the same where um, I remember many great, um, there were two, I won't say who, but like one musician would tell me privately about another great musician. That guy can't play. 
I'm like saying, this is objectively not true because that other guy is great. And the way they argue, it's, it's on a very, you know, like, kind of like a high level. He doesn't like this, small things about the other yeah. guys playing. And I realized, wait a second, if Chopin, maybe Chopin is being harsh about certain things. I mean, I don't know. I'm not there. That's the written quote. Then later, I read a quote by Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky loves Schumann. <laughs> and everyone, a lot of people love Schumann. And I'm like, wait, I have to reevaluate this. So <laughs> to go back to, just to maybe get more insight to what you said, which is absolutely true, the gray area of this discussion, it's very hard to stamp your foot and say something is absolutely right because it's quite, it's so hard. We don't have recordings. And then if we had recordings, that would be awesome. But I want to ask you this, and you have talked about this. Didn't someone like Haydn commission like a mechanical device to have tempo? Um, uh, and do we know, are there any of these mechanical inventions from that period that re retained into today and people are replaying them? Do we know from that, is that a sort of recording that we can look at as a, something useful in our reconstructions? Well, that's that's also a sub subject on 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 its own, and I'm not not an expert in this. So, um, to go a little bit, to rewind a little bit into what you were saying was, you, we we are in the gray zone, but we will talk about this later. But I think it's important before I comment on the mechanical clocks. The the problem or the challenge or the great thing or the fascinating thing, and that's what makes our work so challenging in order to bring it to a larger audience to say like listen we have we have some facts that we cannot ignore and actually pin ourselves to meter our back to the wall okay. you know are the metronomarks so we have some 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 the, met the metronomarks okay. is not up for speculation it's just okay. a frequency per per minute and so the only thing is the way you read them but we, we're going to talk about it cert certainly in, in a few minutes but the what I know, what I've seen from these clockworks, the mechanical clockworks, is that they were made. I uh, I, I, I quoted one of these uh, great uh, uh, pre preservation uh, museums in, in Utrecht. They say like these clockworks were not made to imitate reality. They, they were made to make made to amaze, okay. to do something that humans could not do. Okay. And so if you just, as oftentimes the case, uh, when you look at historical facts, are we today? have used to see in a certain perspective and they said yeah but those things prove that you're wrong and you just twist it a little bit <laughs> you get a completely <laughs> different reality and that's like we should learn to think like that sometimes evidence is not what it seems to be it's right. deceived right right yeah uh, there, there, there were great, great things. It's the same with piano rolls. I mean, uh, sometimes people say, yeah, but we have recordings from early 20th century musicians and they played like so incredibly fast. Yeah. Uh, and I always wondered, I, I, I talked to people, musicians, great pianists, they say, can you do that? I mean, can you repeat, for instance, I, there is a Scriabin also a recording, like it's famous for like Scriabin hit, hitting so many notes a second. And instead of questioning the recording, what we do today is like admiring the yeah. pianist. Like he do the what Genius. That we cannot do. <laughs> <laughs> you dive into the piano rolls a little bit. And again, I'm not an ex expert. You know what they did? There was a recording made by the artist. Then an engineer came and he fixed all the mistakes. Yeah. Was digital editing of all the letter. He did like, editing, like put... MIDI. He just like, went into a Logic Pro and edited the MIDI. <laughs> and, and then, I mean, in the book that we are writing will be right. a chapter on this. And we will quote an article, like a journal on automatic uh, pianos. And they did some research. Of course, many of those original roles disappeared. There were only the edited ones. But what they discovered is that the big companies that they just speed up, sped up the recordings, <laughs> even signed right. off by the by the musicians. And so what we are listening to is an updated, upgraded reality. And we yeah. take that as a reality, right. knowing that we cannot repeat it anymore. So when something is too good to be true, it probably <laughs> is not true. But that's, that, that's hard to convince people to look at this way. Yeah. yeah. We were, okay. We were, so we, we kind of like were skirting the, the, the outset, the, the around the topic. Let's dive into the topic now. Can you give a definition of whole beat theory? A short five, four minute definition of it or however long. Elevator pitch, 20 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> 
I should learn that, by the way. I'm not. I, I, I should. Uh, I should do better my best in doing this. So, in the whole beat metronome practice or principle, um, we consider the metronome mark to be read in a slightly different way. Whereas, for, for instance, if you have a metronome mark half note 88, where the half note does not represent the half note of the comp composition, so the real duration, but the definition of the tactus, the schlag, so the definition of the up and down of the tempo. So that's not so easy actually as an explanation, so I apologize for that, but it means that, this, that the, metronome, the metronome ticks actually uh, indicate the subdivision of that match of that note value. So here, Czerny, whole half note 108. That means that every tick represents the quarter note. It is very similar to what we still do in music schools. We are not we we let our students count like one and two and right. three and four and that's the same principle. So when you scroll back to the mensural notation, like 15, 16, 17, even 18th century, there, the one tactus consisted out of two movements. So there you have definitions, plenty of them, that say like one schlag, one beat equals two movements. And it's from that tradition that the metronome first was introduced. It changed, of course, later. But that's the reason. So here in this case of Czerny, if you literally would play what's written, uh, quoted from memory, you have to play 14.3 notes a second here. Right. Which even Lang Lang cannot do. Eh? Lang Lang recorded this piece in 88 for the half note. Eh? But um, people say, yeah, when he would like, when he would want to do that, he would be able to, you know, trust me, when he, when he would have been able to play 108, he would play 108. <laughs> Now I, I actually now I did a little bit of research. I remember there was many a few months ago I got really interested in this topic and then I spent like a whole night <laughs> just going over it. It's so fascinating. And there were people on the internet who were saying, "Look at me, I can play this." And then they post a video and then it does look like look they they put the clock and they are matching the tempo and the guy is playing it. And uh so what would you say to that? Well, first of all, um be careful being on YouTube. I mean, I know what you can do there. Like, I want to don't want to say it's fake news. I don't want to say nobody can play this um, in tempo. I'm but, just saying, um, in particular, this particular piece. I'm not sure about the other pieces, but just this one. Yeah. So this one, the recording you refer to, was played firstly on a digital piano. I would oh, invite sure. to play it on a party piano. No aftertouch, no. So that's one thing. First, second thing is um, look at the articulation, look at the expression, look at the quality of the recording. Thirdly, go to number two. Fourthly, go to number three, and then go to number four. There you have repeated notes. Now, what do you mean by no. that? Let's 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 be specific. Now, are you saying that uh, technically what would be impossible? The speed. Okay, the actual speed, and so in, in on the forte piano is what you're saying. On the forte piano, it's not as a no-brainer. I mean, yeah. those recordings you refer to there are a handful eh, of the yeah. first three of this. This, this uh, it, why why not playing the entire book, for instance? Okay, so you're saying oh. that that the digital keyboard allows, because of the nature of it, allows them to tackle some of these pieces. But when you actually go to a physical instrument. That is gone. That that you can those advantages disappear and it becomes impossible. I'm listen. A lot of people say like that. My main point of our main point because we should talk about my colleague uh, Dr. Lawrence Guardian as well. And eh? we're writing Absolutely. the book with. He is the true initiator of all of this. Yeah. So that my main point is like this is physically impossible. So therefore, that we need to find another. Well, the the impossibility, technically speaking is only the i would say the sexy argument it's like it's like right it's what you're saying everybody. is that ultimately that's not the main point of this right that, that's that's it's just like the main point. yeah and people but get hung important. up and i understand what you're saying this so you, people who think that ah, i found a hole in this entire argument because i found one person who can actually play this devastates the whole thing but that's not really what you're talking about you, well and that yeah. one person cannot play this first of yeah. all i want to see it live <laughs> yeah i want to see it at a real piano and I'm not saying that I've seen that recording that the first of first two etudes like are not are entirely impossible. I mean, you showed a work that Czerny designed for 
medium level students eh? it's i mean i can show you some stuff that is like um this is like i mean it's just a scale eh? scroll through this only scroll scroll through this entire book and you will be i mean there are repeated notes for instance repeated notes there i can <laughs> i would love to be on stage yeah and say okay someone who can play this for me with the metronome ticking gets five thousand euros but there's wow. one caveat if yep. you go sit at that piano play the first note and you cannot do it you give me five thousand euros i mean this is totally crazy but it, and nobody would show up nobody right. would show up well i hope the internet hears that and i hope somebody wants to do that because i would be very curious to see if somebody try it um but actually we, we we had to say we had this plan where we i i blocked it i mean with with lawrence and my colleague and yeah. another pianist Bob Canguela, said let's put five thousand euros together and just make a video like guys if you can come over do a live stream i'm my 40 piano you get the money but first you have to you have to counterweight this money you know right, right. that if you cannot do it i mean technically technically it's it's our eye openers yeah um like people say, how much love sonata of Beethoven? That's like, of course, that's an exception. It's so difficult. It was supposed to be so difficult. Yeah, but where are the quotes of the 19th century? Where are where do I read one author that says like, yeah, what Beethoven did there is technically impossible? N nowhere. So this also this work. Where do I read Journey's Schule der Gelaufigkeit or his daily exercises to be really impossible? Right. D nowhere. Right. So, That's but the tough. real connection, of course, with the notation of the metronome mark is is coming through the notation and the tempo principles of the of the tempo ordinario. I mean, but then we are very very technical. You yeah. have to assume then that what we know from the 18th century, like for instance, the middle tempo in the 18th century for a normal common time, four four with 16th notes, so normal stuff, like a first invention of Bach. There is actually no denial, also not from people who, did, who, who wrote books and claim something else, yep. that the middle temper is around the second quarter note. But then suddenly when the metronome comes, that middle tempo doubled. I mean, how are you going to explain that? Right. So that's interesting. That's that's interesting. Yeah, and, and you know, I've I, I'm I, I've been this is why it's so fascinating because it seems like um it seems like you found something very, very interesting that is seems like a core part of the whole performance, which is how fast does this darn thing go? And that is the most important. That's probably one of the most important things. And exactly course, <laughs> now you now you nailed it. Right. That's well, I mean tempo, how fast is this be? everything. Now I have a question to ask you. I'm not at all an expert in this, so I really have no dog in this race. But I am very interested in the truth. So, um, when, is it true that the if you had two two as a time signature, or the number was smaller, did that mean it was slower? Did that mean like because the number is smaller, like if it's two two as opposed to four four, you're assuming that the tempo would also be slower, something like that? That's a very complicated question. I try. I'll try to answer that as as, as easy as possible. Like you have the also the cut time with the C yeah. with the stroke, like it's the same, um, and you have common time. So. What people refer to as a la breve, sometimes compositions have that in Beethoven's time, Mozart's time. Many musicians and teachers will say that's double tempo. So technically the a la breve is double the tempo of common time. But there is one big caveat that's that in the a la breve that they're talking about, the note value used is half of that of common time. So basically, oh, wow. If you go to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, that's maybe not a, not a, the, the greatest example because it's two four, but it's the same principle of notation. Mozart's Fortieth Symphony, the G minor Symphony, first movement. Right. That's maybe Hamel Clavier Sonata is perfect example. You will see that Beethoven basically only uses eighth notes as fast as note value. Okay. So there you can ask the question. Yeah, but if if you double the tempo and you have the note value, then the tempo is equal. Why do you use that? Why is that in place still? It's because of the interpretation. This Hammerklavier Sonata is supposed to be played. Beethoven used that notation because he wanted to have a more legato, more cantabile, maybe a little slower tempo than when he would have used common time with 16th notes. Right. 
And that's, of course, not what you hear today. You hear that it's in like insanely fast tempi, never hitting the 138. In spite of what people say, there is research done by the Staatliches Institut Musikforschung in Germany, which uh, actually there was the, they based their research or they, they're, they're, they, they started their research based upon a, an, a lecture that Andras Schiff gave in 2007, which more whole lecture, where he said, like, yeah, you just have to practice a little bit and then you can play all of that. <laughs> and they said, like, he should know better because no pianist that they measured, 45 or 50 pianists they measured, no of them, none of them reached the 138. Really? Okay. Which is, by the way, only in Allegro, huh? <laughs> really? Granted, originally it was Allegro Asai, Beethoven scratched out the Asai and he left the 138, but we can go to Presto if you want with this piece. What if he would have wanted you to play Prestissimo? And already now people, like also in the Beethoven symphonies, um, you have movements that are marked Allegro, ma non troppo, and nobody can play it. Eh? So okay. there are a lot of, if you look at this like from a distance and you can say, okay, I have someone who can play the Czerny Opus 299 number one on the digital piano at Tempo. Okay, articulation is off. There is no you. There is no room anymore any longer for dynamic uh, accentuation, what have you. Okay, all fine. But take a little bit step back. I can give you 500 pieces that you will never be able to play. Can you give some examples? For instance, Chopin concerti, and people will 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 freak out now when I say that. Yeah, of course, everybody plays at tempo. No, nobody does. Even in the slow movements, we we will have some chapters in the book analyzing some performances. What they do is not only start slower, but also you will see that in the passages where all, uh, where Chopin has this bel canto ornamentation, where he's famous for, they slow down till below whole beat tempo. Eh? Really, but we are so used to that. That nobody noticed that anymore, and this and that's is a not that's a natural anymore. thing, you know. I mean, nobody asked them to, but it, it they naturally shifted to something that what sounded right to them, and and that was all natural. And they went, they tried to go fast, and then of a natural accord, they went slower, and and that that's really interesting how. Uh, you found that from a different route. You went through the the theoretical route, which is well, you did the research to to, to determine. Um, now, but you said people would come after you for Chopin. Now, Chopin seems to be nineteenth century, and people will say, "Wait a second, okay, met the metronome, the nineteenth century." Um, here's one thing: so we have students who have seen Mozart play Francis Plante, right? The 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 90-year-old, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chopin, who saw yeah. Chopin play, or students uh, who, were, who knew all of this personally and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, how can there be such an inflation of BPM uh, if they're so slow back then? I mean, if they were half, why was there a sudden burst of BPM increase in the 19th That's century? That's an excellent question. And yeah. it's one of the most asked questions, and it's, it's like the easiest one to answer. But... The, it would be very hard, and would be it would you would have to do a lot of research to really reconstruct the entirety. So, what happened is you have this evolution in the nineteenth century that that actually was was always there. Humanity never looked back. We we start to do that. So I'm not blaming anyone for saying like, yeah, we don't want to, to hear from this because then we have to play differently. So there's also still a sign like. We have to look back if we want to reconstruct something. So, but humanity never did that. So, when you have a student of Chopin, he didn't play, at least in general, he played like people were expecting him to play in 1870. When you have recordings of 2014, piano roll recordings, yeah, you will hear the performance practice of 2014. The assumption that when you hear someone playing in 1932 who heard Liszt play, that this is the same thing. It's just something that you will never be able to prove and was not there. I give you just one example. If you look at our, at our pianists today, who is playing still like Francis Planté? Who is taking him as an example? We have his recordings and yet nobody plays like him. So imagine you are there and you've never heard Chopin or you have had only lessons from. I mean, the notion that pianists over time had a kind of um, ambition to safeguard the tradition was, it was never there. 
They tear down 16th, 17th century buildings to build a parking lot in 1967, <laughs> even. So they threw away instruments. Why did Bülow not play on a Beethoven Hammerflügel when he wanted to be true to Beethoven? He played on a late 19th century piano. Right. Why did they transform all the organs? I mean, that's once you start to understand that. I give you one example. Like, um, what's the name of the uh, of the of the list uh, student? Um, maybe I come up with it, but I have a memory gap now. So, but he wrote an article in 1914 about Liszt, and he said, like, listen. When I played the Don Juan variations for Liszt, I mean, one of the most difficult pieces Liszt wrote in, in, in 1800, Rosenthal, Rosenthal, in 1876, wow. Liszt was already amazed about my speed. You hear that? <laughs> so already there, Liszt was amazed about this, while Liszt had the name of playing slow. But then Rosenthal said, when he would hear me play it today, he would not be able to believe what I can do. If really? students... Wow. If students of Liszt would be returning today, they would have to practice four times as much to enter a conservatory. And then we are only 1924. I mean, the level of pianists acoustically recorded of 1930s compared to today, it's not a match. Eh? Yeah. So the notion that Liszt would come back here and win like every competition on earth it's simply not true. Oh, you'll upset a lot of people by saying that. <laughs> yeah. First of all, how can you know? The only sources we have point to, a perf I mean, this was an incredible performer. That yep. is what we know. But in terms of technical speed and numbers of notes per second, he would have been outperformed. Well, it's just like the, it's just like the Chopin, uh, the Chopin competition. I mean, the poor man was a very frail man. I mean, I heard that he was less than 100 pounds. He, he was very weak. He was sick his whole life. We don't, um, I mean, and then, um, but his pieces, the way people play them, like the Polonaise, the heroic one, it's, they play it like Liszt would play. And I, I, I'm imagining Liszt would play it like gigantic power and everything. But the, 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 the poor guy was very sick himself. And, and he, I don't think he could push that hard. There, there is a beautiful quote, two, two beautiful quotes, one by Chopin, but the other is by Liszt. He was, uh, you know, posing for a portrait by a painter, and the painter said to him, uh, as, I don't know, the years, like in the 1840s or 50s even, the painter said to him, like, can I be blunt with you? But you sometimes play like a charlatan, right? <laughs> and there was like this moment of not friction, but um, then he said, can you maybe demonstrate a Bach piece for us, an organ piece that he transcribed for piano? And then Liszt said, how do you want me to play it? And then the painter said, like, what do you mean? Well, he said, I can play it as the author wanted to have it played. And then he played. And it was described like Liszt played like beautifully. Everything was there. Or he said, you can, you can, I can play it like I like it a, a, a bit more, a peu plus piquant, which is like a bit more spicy. Right. And then he started to probably, I, we don't know, play a little bit faster. And then he said, I can play it like I play it on stage, like a charlatan. <laughs> because they wanted, I didn't use it, those words, but said people want to see stage monkeys. Oh, wow. It's in the 19th century, yeah. Right. So the, the, the idea that Liszt, it's a very important quote because the idea that Liszt had a different mask, so to say, on stage than privately or what he really himself, Liszt was not, the means Liszt was not able to just be his own artistic self on stage. He had to appeal to an audience. Right. And there is this famous quote by, I think also Rosenthal, was it? who said about this Polonaise um, with the octaves, someone played it and he said like, I don't want to hear you how fast you can play octaves. I want to hear the Polish cavalry coming over the mountain. <laughs> so you will, you will very rarely find in the 19th century in general, eh, people are using quotes like very narrowly yeah. that yeah. The, there was a comment like, oh, why are people playing so slow? What happened? Are you falling asleep like Beethoven played much? The opposite is true. People were freaking out for these new tendencies. What happened with music? Moshle said in the 1970s, is it because I'm old and my blood is running slower? But why are ple people playing Mozart so fast? You cannot even hear the notes anymore. So this, this tendency of speeding up happened in overnight almost. 
Yeah, there um, you have it. Now, some people have said Beethoven's metronome was broken. What would you say to that? Then, if that's true, then Beethoven was an idiot. I mean, how can you, how can you not see your entire career? I mean, the years that he used the metronome, that when you put the thing thing on sixty, that it's not giving the seconds. And secondly, his entire entourage never told him. In, in, in fact, actually used the metronome like him because metronome marks given by Czerny or Marshallis or other people on Beethoven's work are exactly in line with what Beethoven gave. So they have continued the mistake. You see, that would be a conspiracy of the first order. <laughs> like four generations of people say, we know that Beethoven's metronome was broken, but we are going to use it like him because we don't want to offend the holy man. I mean, I'm ridiculizing a little bit. That's simply not possible. He got the damn thing from Melzo, one of the greatest mechanical invent, uh, uh, engineers history knew. So Melzo would give Beethoven a broken metronome. That's like, I'm clapping in my hands. <laughs> and you have other theories. Like, did, did I have a metronome here, by the way. Some say like, he, oh, there, it's falling apart. He didn't read it like it's supposed to, read, to be read, like on the, on the upper, upper side of this uh, weight, but he, he used it here. And miraculously, then you have 10% slower tempi. So there is solved. I mean. And what was the quality of these metronomes? Were they, some people say, no, oh, they're defective. That's the reason why. They slow down. It works or it doesn't work. So you have two weights. Huh? You have this weight and there is a weight here. Maybe is the craftsmanship good on, on, the, on those first metronomes? Oh. We checked this one. It's not restored. That's the ins inside of the met. Uh, yeah, can you see it? Oh, there. It's a bit dark. Camera. Yeah, it's a bit dark. It's yeah. Dark. Yeah, it's dark. So you have a second weight here and a weight here, and that determines the speed. The 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 clockwork is just the the traction. So it works, and then it's perfect, or it doesn't work at all. We checked this with my digital app. There is a video on my channel even doing that. It's like hundred percent accurate. Okay. Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Also, this 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 idea was a Spanish article. I mean, reading this from below, how are you going to do that? I mean, after two seconds, you see the thing is not made for that. But it's all because people. I mean, I'm sorry to talk about this so long, but it's like, for me, I'm wondering why is it so difficult to accept that the basic facts, like a metronome mark, is problematic in itself. We should be able and have the courage to define the problem. What is actually the problem? Do we have a problem? No. Then I invite you to on a stage and play. Or do we have a problem? And what's then the solution? And the solution will not lie in these exceptions, like the metronome was broken, or Beethoven didn't hear. Then Chopin's metronome was broken. Schumann's metronome was broken. Uh, Liszt's metronome was broken. And, and hundreds of composers' metronome. I mean, we should face it. We have a problem with those metronome marks. That's right. the thing, and we have to solve it. If we care about the intention of the composer, that's an important um, entrance as well. Because you don't have to play like that. Huh? You don't have to. Right, right. Now, um, I was looking at all the people who were disagreeing with you, and one person pretty triumphantly decided, like, I've finally, oh, this is conclusive. That's the end of the discussion. He said that. Let's look at the billing of the concerts. And if we look at the, the time of the, the, the different pieces, like for instance, Beethoven and in talking about when he premiered Symphony 9 or whatever, just all of these operas, he said impossible for it to be whole beat because if it were be whole beat, it would be far too long for what is on the billing. And no one's going to sit there for, I don't know, six hours or something. Um, so what would you say to people who say, got you? Now look at the look at the um, uh, look at the the, the 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 flyer for the concert. It d clearly can be a six-hour concert. Yeah, I know the document. I made a video on it. I will make some other videos on it as well. So this this thing of durations has many aspects, many entrances. First of all, 
you have to always contextualize information. When you just have buildings like that, Mozart's opera starts at 7.30 and at 10 o'clock. I mean, and then surprisingly, all the operas that are played start at 7.30 and end at 10 o'clock. What was exactly played? Do we know that? If you know the history that's completely ignored in that document, the history about the 19th century performance practice, very rarely entire works were played. People will be freaking out now when they hear that. Yeah, but that's your solution. But I'm sorry. It's the reality. In Vienna, it's not my words. In, in, in the book will be several quotes. I made videos about that. Um, the, the people who researched them, that very rarely were entire par, uh, symphonies played. The London Symphonic Orchestra only started end of the 19th century playing entire symphonies. So if you have a duration of something, what exactly is the context around that? One thing. First, is that data correct? I mean, if someone said like the concert lasted three hours and a half, really? Or do we have a second source confirming that? That's very important because otherwise you're building a case upon like nothing. Thirdly, if you go into durations, a lot of durations are whole beat, but that of course is not mentioned in that document. For instance, really? list own list own projection of the Hamaglavia Sonata, presque une heure, so almost one hour. I'm sorry, but that's very close to whole beat. It's a peu plus piquant, a little bit more spicy. So, because I did the, the, the Hammer Club, he lost 70, 67, no, um, 67 minutes in whole bit. Yeah, and he said like almost one hour. I mean, those sources are in the footnotes. So, and there are very little, if any, real single beats uh, durations. So, that's also not mentioned. So, when it's when the when duration doesn't match whole bit, then by default it is single bit. But that's not so easy. You have to calculate the duration of the piece. How long was it? Were all the movements played? Were all the repeats played? Were, 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 were the movements cut? I mean, the, the habit of cutting in within the movement was simply there. So, yeah, I can, I can talk forever about this. For instance, that's what I want. To, one of the most important duration sources we have is the Beethoven 1808 concert. So Beethoven gave an Academia concert in December 1808 where he presented his fifth symphony, sixth symphony, the choral uh, variations, um, some pieces of some masses. I mean, a huge program. And I made a video of that and actually says everything. It's 30 minutes, but I think it's worth your time watching because people say like, yeah, when whole beat was true, then it would last eight hours. But you, you see the level we are talking about? There is one That would be the thing. whole, if every single piece was every single movement, was jammed in together. It, that's what they're saying, right? No, yeah, but it's completely wrong as a starting point. Who right. says that you have four minutes, four hours of music in single beat? So I did the math. I calculated everything. And to my surprise, when everybody, when everything would have been played in single beat, um, the concert would only last two hours and 40 minutes. Really? So what about the hour and 20 minutes left? Right. They were just chatting with each other in five <laughs> degrees temperature. It was freezing there. <laughs> and then the discussion ends. And that's such a pity because there are, in that concert, in that four-hour duration, are multiple possibilities for a whole beat performance. Yeah. And why does the discussion end when I present that fact? It should continue there because it's super important. Yeah, Are we really trying to find the truth? Uh, right. Or are you talking to ourselves, which I'm doing right bit, right now, actually? <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's fascinating, and, and I think you, you've hit on something which I'm interested in. And yeah, I would ask people who are interested in this topic. And to your credit, you've actually brought this to a wider range of people, whether they agree or not. They're thinking about this, and they're forced to think about it. And um, and actually, um, uh, can I ask you a question now? You've you have engaged with a lot of people online and, and um, obviously some very vociferous opinions, people who are against you, people who are very, but I've also seen very strong opinions. Uh, what would you say is the percentage uh, looking at your channel? I mean, like how has the reaction been? I've seen people starting threads on Reddit. <laughs> I've seen all sorts of things. Uh, and I'm talking. Famous. Yeah, you're, you're famous. And, 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 but so in a general sense, how would you categorize the reaction? 
we've had periods, you know, go a little bit back, rewind a little bit again, uh, in you know, uh, to take up the uh, the topic of the channel and the development. So when we go back to the period where I decided, to listen, I discussed with my wife, I would like to have a fortepiano to play Beethoven. There was um, a moment on the channel also where I stepped forward with Tempo Research, 2017. People will know this video because it really spiked, like where I started with the ping pong bat, you know, that, that video. It was made because of my colleague, friend now, Dr. Lorenz Guardian, who does this, did this research already from 1980, from the point the book of Talsma, we talked about it at the beginning, was published, he thought when this is true, then I should find more evidence. And he is a priest also, and a professional musician, but his career is definitely being a community priest. And so he is a doctor in theology, and so he, he has this habit of researching terminology. Long story short, we met in 2009, thanks to the clavichord, he's a clavichord lover as well. And so I was not fully convinced what he wrote because he So said you like were that. not convinced. No, because Talsma, the, the the kind of pioneer, he said like this this whole beat principle, he called it differently, he said only applies for fast movements, not for slow movements. Okay. And I just took it like, yeah, what are you going to do? Like slow movements, even playing slower. And Lawrence was like coming to my place for six years. Every holiday, we played music together. We had a great time. And every time he said, do you, you don't want to reconsider? I said, I mean, come on with your stupid theory. Uh, but I suddenly, one day, I said like, I was playing a Mozart sonata, the sixth one, D major, Adagio, marked my tempo. And there was this mark by Moscheles, which I got from Lawrence in my score. I said, but that's exactly half wait a minute, there is no way I can play this double because you have ornaments on 30 second notes or what have you. I took the phone, I said like, listen, we have to talk. <laughs> no, actually it didn't went like that. A few week later, he came over for a visit, it was in January. I didn't have time, that because I was so busy. But uh, Anya said, no, 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 this we have, we have agreed. I mean, you will have a great time. You need some, you need some things, not some other things to do than just work. And so he came and I said to Lorenz, we have to talk because your book, he published a book in, in, in 2010, Taktun Pendelschlag, which is, a, I mean, mind-blowing book, but nobody read it. We have to translate that. And from that day, I started to study this more seriously with him. And now we are finishing a manuscript where actually I doubled the size of his contribution. There will be a book like around 700, 750 wow. pages that will be published wow. probably this year. But then I stepped forward on the channel as well, like, listen, this is what I'm going to do. In the hope, in the expectation <laughs> that people would love it, would participate. I went on right. Facebook, with the videos. I have to say on Facebook, I had to just go away because you can yeah. say like, listen, uh, those are just anonymous people. But after a while, when it gets really personal, it gets under your yeah, skin. Yeah, it's, it, you, it's, it's strange how... how um vitriolic it is you know over a scholarly it, question i mean it's a scholarly question and it's, it is. it's oddly personal and i've always found that bizarre and i mean you can disagree all you want but i mean like getting really nasty and all of that it's really i, I think we need more charity uh especially in, in and I, this is an important topic and i hope really more people uh discuss it now now you sorry i cut you off you're talking about facebook what, what about Fa youtube and and everything else well, we then had a period on YouTube, I'm talking 2017, 18, where this all blew up, like it was, I had a lot of attention. But I had to call in some moderators to moderate because there were, there were moments, like I said, like, and people, when you search for my name, it's a women's shadow banning. I mean, as if I am the only <laughs> YouTube creator who has a moderation team for the channel. I mean, we have 100,000 views now, that's a very small channel, but I don't want to have anyone feel unsafe. I started with that, not because I care. My people, my audience, even my patrons were saying like, Wim, we don't comment on your videos anymore because people were following them even like on their channels yeah, and like yeah. coming after them. I, just, I don't and know so, what it is about the internet and anon anonymity uh, that just makes people crazy. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. It's, it's, un it's unbelievable. Um, but on the I, other I, hand, I, on the other I hand, said, you 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 had some. I mean, 
you have a lot of positive comments, a lot of yes. positive comments. Like, I don't want people to to just take away from this that it's just like a rejection. Actually, if you go to many of the chat, uh, if you go to the channel, there's some negative comments. There's a lot of positive comments because, I mean, this can tie into the next topic. And I'm I'm sorry if this is taking up too much of your time, Wim, but this is uh this is kind of an important time thing. Of the world. Yeah. We live in whole day time here. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> double time. <laughs> Which is, I've always, and where I come from, it's always bang, 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 fast, fast, don't make mistakes. You know, if you, if you play and then you walk off and off stage, your hands fall off, it just doesn't matter. You have to meet, you have to be fast, you have to memorize lots of repertoire and all of that. And people get injuries, they get a lot of injuries, yeah. and nobody seems to want to talk about that. And, and it just seems like, yeah, you're not a genius. Of course, you, 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 you're, you. and people feel incredibly depressed. When they they work hard and maybe perhaps just because of, through no fault of their own because of the, just the nature of the culture they're pushed to a state where they they're just overworked they get injured they can't play they get depressed and nobody wants to talk about that in classical music you know and and some some of these injuries are quite serious so maybe you've you've actually made a few videos on that so why don't you talk about that topic and the people who thank you because they've you're addressing this. That's an excellent, uh, yeah, question. I mean, and it's a very important one. You can ask, like, okay, we are reconstructing something like that should be actually done by more musicians. Like reconstructing what what did Beethoven had in mind? It's such a fascinating question. I mean, yeah. let's be honest. And sometimes I hear people saying, like, uh, yeah, but we evolved, and uh, you know, and things are like. If Beethoven would give a concert in Carnegie Carnegie Hall tomorrow, would you go or not? I would be there. Probably, yeah. <laughs> and so that's because we want desperately to hear what, I mean, that's such a fascinating, and that we don't have recordings, it's the better because we can even then dream. Yeah. But this, the stupid thing that actually, or the irony of the case is that these metronomarchs that were given by these composers at a time where Tempi sped up, where the player, not necessarily, and in most cases, actually not was not anymore the, the composer. You had the separation in the 19th century, you had the, the performing musician, that composers gave metronome marks to, 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 you know, tell the world and the future worlds, this is my tempo, please take it into account. That those, that those metronome marks today are the incentives like to push people over the, over the edge. Yeah. And you know, nobody can like, I, I wouldn't say not single pieces here and there, but in general, this is not a practice. A single beat metronome reading is not a practice that we can apply in every piece. But yet, uh, the students are pushed like, uh, just go around the corner there. There is a solution. And they come there, and there is nothing. There is another corner. And so waking up every day with the notion, I have to practice more because I cannot play the Waldstein sonata. I cannot play the Appa sonata. And so... In my days, in the 90s, in conservatory, there was the physiotherapist lived around the corner. But today, he's <laughs> part of the conservatories. Wow. The students now are oh, leaving wow. conservatories with major issues already. Yeah. And this is... That's a big story. I mean, that, that should be a... a yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. And then, are we really serious in believing that the 19th century, like Beethoven, Chopin, Schumann injured himself... We know that not because of playing, because of this stupid machine. Are we really serious in our belief that those people could do all of that so easily? Well, we cannot repeat anymore. And then in the framework, in the perspective from evolution, they give me one evolution, like from a tech technical perspective, like uh, driving from a bicycle to a car, from buildings, where we can say, listen, Actually, humanity declined in quality. We somehow... Oh, in music? Absolutely. Oh, wow. We could get into that. <laughs> so, well, it's certainly... not possible. It's not possible. <laughs> I mean, how, how difficult this is to understand that in Beethoven's day, in the pre-industrial age, that also musical tempi were slower than today. How just... That's a totally unscientific argument. But yeah. think about it. Do you have a, an anecdote of someone who really opposed you and then turned around and actually agreed with you? That's an excellent question. I have to I have to think about that because we are focused more on people <laughs> who do not agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, like the story of Alberto is really, an, I mean, it's not really someone, someone who opposed me, but 
he is, is of course part of the of the of the authentic sound story we are recording the ninth symphonies now together on four hands they, they have been recorded eight of them the ninth we will do in may he's doing a lot of chopin that's going to be released um but he was actually a you could say child prodigies, maybe a, a huge word, but he got a huge uh, scholarship to go to the United States to study at Colburn private school. And then literally he saw one of my Chopin videos and he couldn't be on the next plane early enough. Wow. Like incredible. this is an exceptional story. He knocked on my door literally in the temple of Beethoven's fifth, probably I don't remember, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, so, but from some, you know what the difficulty is not agreeing and certainly publicly, when people have a position, and most of us have, or are playing in an orchestra, or are um, have the ambition of entering a university or whatever, I doubt they actually have the option to really fully publicly agree with what we are doing. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting consideration. Yeah, that I've never thought about that. Yeah. yeah, we had we had a trio of uh, of Beethoven. That's. Uh, so I can share the story. I mean, the, the name is, is anonymous, but we recorded like, the, the reduction of Beethoven from a septet with uh, Massimiliano, clarinet player, who bravely took a position there, even though he's, uh, he's uh, the, the leader clarinetist in, in his orchestra. We had also a cello player. And then miraculously, we had a good time play, recording that. And miraculously, like one week before the release, he, he told me that I want to record this stuff. Really? Like my, my phone needs to still be ringing. So he had... What he did was send that recording probably mm. to his friends, colleagues, and they made him very clear that they went, when he went that path, there was yeah. no future for him in the orchestra. So, which is That's completely unacceptable no, because, I mean, how is the musical world even start to think that they can control what a colleague musician mm. should think? Yeah. I mean, this, you know, that's, that's a good segue. Um, I remember I interviewed Cyprian Katsaris. And he told me a mind-blowing story. He said one of the most powerful agents in classical music told him in his contract, he wanted to sign him because he was a hot up-and-coming artist. He said, no transcriptions. In, <laughs> you cannot record a single transcription. And he said, no, I'm not signing this contract. And I thought that was unbelievable. I mean, the cult, imagine the culture. People giving you artistic decisions for you, making your own artistic decisions for you. And, and this is a segue. Okay, let me tell you something. I was very sympathetic to you because I realized there was one video you had. I'm going to show this. This is interesting. This is a video of you holding music in the Galant style. Oh. <laughs> and, a long time ago. Uh, a long time ago, uh, 2016. And of course, this is the Learn Partimento podcast. And Yer uh, Professor Robert Yerdigan is all about Partimento. And, um, and actually, when I emailed you, I said, um, of course, we're going to largely talk about whole beat, but I would love to, because you're into the research and how they performed back in the day. I'm sure this is a question that you've thought about, which is improvising cadenzas, improvisation, um, composition, you know, how they were player composers, essentially, basically. Many of these great masters and um, what is your take um, on, on improvisation in the 18th century, even in the 19th century? Um, I'm sure you don't, I don't know if you get this question at all, but this is, uh, this is the setting that I want to ask you, which is because we're into partimento, which is partimento is improvising over bass lines, using that as a training wheel mechanism to become a composer eventually. And it's all about improvising. It's wonderful. Uh, what do you think about improvisation in the 18th century? What's your position? Uh, and I'd love to start there, perhaps. I was this weekend um, at a congress in Amsterdam in a beautiful church, like a beautiful project, the Orgel Park. It was about audience, new audiences for uh, organ. It was fascinating. And there was one concert with very progressive music improvised and also one guy improvised a choral fantasia at the uh, German Baroque copy organ, copy of an, of an uh, Hillebrand organ. I am so jealous on people who can do this. I was not trained as an improviser, which I even told my teacher Jacques van Ootmans and later, like this is a huge, huge miss in my career or in my development. Today it's different. People learn to play bas basso continuo, learn to improvise. It's essential. I'm, I, I did not have the training. Um, I try to, to do that now and, and more and more. But also, like, you go in Mozart, you play a first movement, and you make just an elaborated version, the second one. 
second second repeat, which makes it so interesting. Yeah. Um, I think it's essential, and I would hope that next generations um, that this and that see it happen that it becomes more and more part of education. It's also a way of expressing like liberation, coming coming free from the score. I mean, it's weird, eh? First, we were talking about how to come as close as possible to the score, and I am saying like come free of the score. <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So. No, I, I support that a hundred percent, and I have all the admirations of people who can really do that. Like, and and I think they are undervalued these days. Like, I see great musicians who improvise. Like, you cannot even tell if it's like a seventeenth century uh, choral fantasy or not, and yet they don't receive the applause they should. I think it's the highest art level. Well, I think can... was we talked about the culture. I mean, I mean, just listening to your story, your war stories about Holbeat. I mean, it was extremely hostile to improvisation in, the, in I guess, the 20th century. Um, and now it's changed, I think. I honestly think the, the, the culture has really changed because many people are interested in thorough bass, basso continuo partimento, schema theory. Uh, it's becoming like, I guess, you you know, like the new a newer generation and uh, are starting to realize, because it's all maybe it's all due to historically informed performance, people are realizing, hey, you know, I mean, these are kind of like, proto jazz musicians in a weird way you know in, in the yeah. same, like kind of the, the 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 language might be different but maybe a, a bit of the philosophy the oral tradition a lot of things I, I wish we had recordings of the 18th century that would be incredible we could pick them apart the, the way people pick apart a charlie parker recording i mean the detail of the people write theses you know about uh, like just recordings in jazz and that's the same thing i mean like um uh, you talked about repeats, improvising cadenzas, improvising whole sonatas. Um, you're, you're very. Let me ask you this, uh, Wim. Who is a composer that's very close to your heart that that you feel like you've played a lot? Of, I know you mentioned Chopin. You studied Chopin quite seriously. Who else is very close to your heart in terms of like just anything, the language, the sound, the compositions? Basically, any composer that I'm playing is the best. I just recorded the well tempered keyboard part one. And then each after each recording I text Alberto and say, Come on, like Bach is like unbelievable. <laughs> and then we go back to Beethoven and I say, I'll listen like Beethoven is like and then you play a piece by Mozart and you say like yeah, Mozart. I mean <laughs> I I I try not to choose and that and people people ask what's your preferred composer? I would say, listen, I would have a hard time choosing because I have two composers I want to travel back to. But I cannot use them at the same time. Who are they? Uh, and Mozart and Schubert. But right before they die, I would say to Mozart, "Listen, dude, early December, take these pills, antibiotics, <laughs> and uh, don't think about it." And Schubert, same thing. Yeah. I mean, imagine those two composers. Uh, I mean, Mozart had a few more years. Uh, well, Robert Le uh, Professor Robert Levin said he had two hundred sketches unfinished. It's not unbelievable. I mean, he would have Mozart kept going. Mozart Schubert. Uh, Mozart, Mozart. Two, 200 unfinished yeah, sketches. Right. Unbelievable. Manuscripts ready to go. <laughs> ready to I be like finished. He, he would have, if we have it, I mean, he was just on the on the bridge of becoming Kapellmeister, I believe, at yeah, the nice, yeah. of Dome. And then he said, like, finally, I can write church music and leave the opera behind. Not that I hate opera, <laughs> but I mean, can you imagine have big cantatas like from Mozart? Unbelievable. Like, yeah. yeah. The double oh. pukes. <laughs> and, and then Schubert, I mean, Schubert. I, Alberto played a lot of Schubert when he came first. And uh, Schubert is for me a composer that I love his melodies, but I like personally Beethoven's structure so much. Like Schubert is like sometimes wondering, like I'm talking, like I'm just going from here to there. But then he played and I said like a sonata, A major, I believe, like and, and the harmonies are like, really, are you kidding me? <laughs> like this, this dude at the end of his life, he said like, now it's maybe time to have some composition lessons with Albert, Albert Beck. Like yeah. really, <laughs> it's like this explosion of talent. It's, yeah. it's so unbelievable. And I, so I wouldn't know how to, who I would travel back to. I would be a very hard choice. I have a, a, something you want. I want a statement that I want you to react to, which is I've always found great composers when, or just great music. It sounds good slowed down as it does fast. I've, I've always found this. If I take a Charlie Parker solo or Bud Powell, it sounds unbelievable. It still sounds beautiful as the chords change and the melodies on top. Same with Chopin. So like, for instance, um, and this, I, I learned this just one, like, like 10 years ago. I took 
some, I downloaded some MIDI of his etudes and I was trying to learn some of them. And I said, okay, I got to slow this down. So I played the MIDI and just, just slow. It's so beautiful. The pieces sound great. Slow. You don't like, I, I mean, I like fast. I'm not going to come here on this show and say, hey, I don't like fast. I like fast, you know, but it, it sounds so good. Slow. The, it's the information is still coherent and beautiful. And it maybe in some ways is better if it's slowed down. So for instance, you recorded the Opus 10 number one, the etude. People think usually play like a blur. And I, I, I like that. I mean, but I also like what you did a lot because this is like, um, you can hear the chords and you can hear the harmony much better if it's slowed down. What, what, what do you think about this uh, whole concept of, it, it sounds good slow as well. It's, it's a, I mean, it's an excellent way of looking at it because there is nothing wrong with playing music like the way you play. The, the, the way, I mean, we talked about people who are opposed to what, what we are doing and some, sometimes very in an ugly way even. But the reason I've been thinking about that, but I think the reason why is they, some consciously but some inconsciously realize that when you want to reconstruct what the composer had in mind, you have to give up about the other way of playing or and even better you have to you cannot go on stage anymore pretending that what you're going to play is actually what the composer had in mind because there is something there that you know you do not apply and so but of course i mean when you when you play chopin's first etude like that i mean there is still something there huh? I, oh, I would yeah. say the more you travel back in time, the more complex the music is, the more you lose when you speed up. The, the if, most if I never heard, if I never heard it played fast and I only heard it played slow, and that was like the standard, I would have been totally fine. I would have been like, yeah, that's that's the way to play it because it it it's it's it sounds beautiful. I mean, there's nothing else to say. Even 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 on top of that, when you would when you have a piece that you've never heard and you hear it that fast, you're not interested. We have developed a, a, a connection with that music that we know so well. The Chopin etudes, everybody knows them so well yeah. that you kind of know what to expect. But if you've never heard the music, it sounds really fast if you would uh, you hear that for the first time. Yeah. Whereas is the, this whole beat concept, it's not so slow if you hear those pieces for the first time. It's still quick. There is <laughs> it. It's still quick, yeah. But what you know what the most powerful addition is or the gain what I mean, for me at least, but I hear that from a lot of people in this whole beat concept is the harmonic feeling. You feel yeah. the structure and the harmonic structure so much. You have more really time better. to absorb. Like number four, like right? You, you played the C sharp one, number four. That one is played so fast, but like there's a lot going on in the counterpoint. There's a lot going on in the music that I feel like if you play it too fast, you kind of miss all of that. Yeah, it becomes a blur yeah. and it becomes like harmonically a blur. It's like a rhythmical pulse that you get. And I get the fascination. I get it. Like if you hear Beethoven, uh, Fifth Symphony and Xander's performance, it's like, like you have this constant pulse and this constant drive. The question is, if, if you reduce the Fifth Symphony to that emotion alone, you can also have a metronome play in that same. I mean, I'm I'm ridiculous. No, right. I mean, no. You can computer. You can put it all into a computer. Yeah, yeah. You can. That's and and that's that's true. I mean, I, I for fun. I mean, we've there's the uh, the what's the guy's name? Uh, non Conlon Nan Caro. I think he was a 20th century composer. He had the player piano that played super fast, like boogie woogie, and he was like a composer and it, very interesting, very interesting. Um, but some, but. It it it's like when one the moment you hit that speed limit of speed, you're starting to think like this is just it's fast, 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 and and now we're you looking at so the speed. Yeah, the, the research that we've done, like research. I mean, it's just uh, the mention of some articles and some studies. We didn't research that, but there is some magical barrier that's in our human system actually built in. It's like around 10 notes a second. And you see that, like, for instance, we measured some Beethoven recordings by Gardner and Norrington who claim to play in Beethoven's Tempe. And okay. sometimes they do, but if, I mean, even an orchestra and with a lot of compromises, but sometimes they slow, they cannot reach the number. And if you count the number of notes they play at their fastest, it's always around this magical number of 10 to 12 notes a second. There is some... We can go faster, mm. but for a short for a short amount of time. Yeah, yeah. And it's magically intertwined with what we can we, we can actually absorb. So when, for instance, you play ten notes a second or a little bit more, you 
human brain has, has a hard time to know if it are triplets or 16 notes. You cannot yeah. distinguish the rhythm it's, anymore. Yeah. And that's so miraculously in line with the result of the whole beat principle, <laughs> where the line, the maximum note of notes is like around 10 notes is really fast, then 9.6 you have. Yeah. You can go faster, but for structural note values that you play like a long time, that's the maximum or that's 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 the highest number and that's so aligned with what we can still absorb and notion and right. so the effect that that the music has when you stay within those barriers where we can actually absorb and process i mean no surprise that it's more interesting right so how many the classical music oh again fifth symphony tonight i mean the music <laughs> gets boring even though we cannot say it the play it slower and people say people will fall slow and sleep no your brain is constantly triggered. Like there is a line, there is a line, there is a rhythmic, there is, oh, and you see like this three-dimensional yeah. structure that, and I'm so convinced that our classical music, you know, today is seen as like in a great danger because, you know, it's under our, our recording industries and things like what have you. How is it possible that marketeers even not see the past potential of this new tendency? I mean, we have to make premieres of the entire 19th yeah, century will be new again. You have to re-record everything. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's so a, imagine that Carnegie Hall, Beethoven Fifth, and the new version of 2023. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Right. Hall will be full. And if we have some influences, even like artistic directors that say, like, listen, guys, don't say it's nonsense. You can have a debate, but give it a chance. Listen yeah. to it twice. We would even play Beethoven Fifth twice. I would, I would, yeah. I would, I would suggest that. It's a huge marketing tool. If you're not interested in the reconstruction, then, for instance, for in, in this, I mean, this is it's something that's it's beyond my comprehension that people reject novelties experiment, which would just blow up the entire classical music well, I have a, industry. I have, a, I have a quick question that I forgot to ask you, which is there were some people who disagreed with you who said L vocal music can't apply to this because of holding a voice, a vocal note inordinately long. So how would you respond to somebody who says it doesn't work because your voice can't hold a note that long? I would respond very quickly. You never tried because there is not an issue with this, not a single one. We are going to record Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is one of the prime examples of many like, yes, it will not work. The singers are preparing and they say like, listen, First of all, in modern tempi, Beethoven's Ninth is a voice-killing symphony. They literally say that, eh? because you have so many intervals, you don't have the time to adjust your voice. Length of notes. That's, that's in single beat, it? right? It's a voice killer in single beat. Yeah, okay. yeah. If, if they reach single beat, because like, there are the presto movement, the opening there, really. You know what happened in the Ninth Symphony? Listen to recordings. They, you have the opening presto, and then comes the, 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 the first solo entry. Tempo drop. They slow down. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. It's, it's a cathedral. Beethoven marks sends a tempo change. Eh? But I want to say, like, have you ever had a professional singer next to you holding a long note? And then go back to the people who sing polyphonic music. They can do it without a vibrato. Eh? They can hold the note for uh, forever. I mean, people who say this also for string instruments, they have never tried. String instruments can, violin players can hold notes for 20, 25 seconds if necessary. And then when it's a problem for Beethoven, suddenly, why it's not a problem for 20th century music? Like Strauss has written pieces, Mahler has written pieces where just the orchestra members have to speak with each other and say, like, change Boeing. There it's not a problem. If we would have the measure, like, like a rule, like, listen, if a composer marks a bow, and everything that's in the bow is supposed to play in one breath of one bow, yeah, then we would have to speed up 20 cent, many, many 20th century music as well, because it's, it's, it's I mean, right, it's right. a non-argument. It's really a non-argument. It's even more. We have sources of the 19th century that say, like, listen, when you are on the countryside, I get it. You have to, you have to speed up the music because the singers cannot hold the notes long enough. So it was seen as a sign of amateurism when you cannot hold long notes. Interesting. Okay. Wow. Well, and I mean, it's a problem maybe today. We are not trained anymore. We do not train our musicians anymore to hold really these long notes. I mean, why they don't have to do it any longer? It's incredible. Well, Wim, I mean, I think you've answered all my questions. I'm sure if um, I'm sure there's. 
I can't wait to read the book because and when is what's the name of the book and when is it coming out? We're still a little bit in a debate of the name of the book, but I, I think because I want to put something be... at the title at the bottom, I just want to give you a plug. So well, <laughs> I'm not going to. Should I just put whole beat theory book? You got to give me some kind of t placeholder title. No, I I, I would like to have the title, but I mean it's a little bit provocative. Fixing the Beethoven mistake. Okay, so I'll put that as just and, a yeah. Okay, that's but great. I, I have to be a little careful, but someone said to me recently, I was in an interview, I don't know, or the talk like, ah, you think he made a mistake? I said, no, 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 no. The world thinks he makes a mistake, and we are going to fix that. At the end, it's not Beethoven who made a mistake. We have to fix the understanding of what he did. Right. You see, right. but maybe it's like a two-trap way of thinking. But uh, we hope to publish it by the end of the year. But I have to say it's an what enormous What is the state work. of it right now? The manuscript, Lorenz part, has been finished. I am almost finished. A few mm. chapters that have no influence in the coherent, you know, in the coherence of the entire uh, book. The, uh, the German parts are being translated uh, now. For seventy percent, that's been done. My part, I'm writing in English. You speak English, uh, is being re-edited. Is also seventy percent done by the summer. We hope to come to a finished manuscript, and we come. Mm four of us together, Lorenz and I as author and the two translators, and to see what is missing, what's maybe too much. And then we go into the process of layouting and then publishing. I mean, it's a huge project, yeah. Oh, who will, have you decided on a publisher? Uh, we will definitely self-publish this. We okay. are even not trying to find a publisher because we want to be in charge and control of the uh, publication ourselves and the, and the promotion. I, we learned, I learned, Lorenz learned a lot of, um, by publishing his book in a peer-reviewed uh, publishing house, but they're not promoting that. It's just that you pay so many dollars or euros and then they publish that and then it's like, you know, we want to be in charge of our work, but we will organize a kind of peer-review board ourselves. Yeah, so that's the question. So people will say, will you have some uh, scholarly review of the book and will people publish yeah. reviews? And, and how will you address that? No, scholarly review, I mean, when you talk to people who are on an academic level, they will say you this is a highly problematic topic. Um, there is, and we will use actually a different kind of perspective. There is this, you know, the terms like paradigm shift is probably right. known to you. Right. That comes from a gentleman named Thomas Kuhn. He wrote in the 60s a book, 1962, a book that was very influential and still today, saying actually how is scientific how is scientific progress made. It's never from within the system. It are always outsiders who see suddenly a solution to an old problem that's being fought fiercely by the system but once it's accepted, it becomes quickly mainstream. Yeah. And so the reason that we're going into a self-publication, uh, that we are going to self-publish our book, is not only because of necessity. There's no university who's going to take the risk to publish it. No, not a single one. It's not a, because of the so content. Interesting, because yeah. it's just it's just too provocative for it's all the content they produce right it's now. It's too hot for them. Imagine that. Wow. wow. And so we will publish it. We will have those comments. But... You know, we will have at the beginning a frequently asked question section. All these questions that you're asking now yeah. will be addressed there in a very sober way. And we believe the message is so simple. You take the metronome and you take two ticks for one and it solves all the problems that we are struggling with for over a century. And so even you could say you don't have to read the book. It's not necessary. Just... That's the only solution. So if the what book other is solution full of the evidence and the, the information that you've collected and all the research, but you're mm. saying that really it's the, that you're in, in a few seconds, that's really the, the what you have to think about, really, the conclusion. I, I wrote one, one full with like pre one, one preface introduction, like, if you're reading now, please stop. You don't need this book. <laughs> Just go to your piano, take a metronome and see for yourself what's happening. You know, the frequency per minute. What can you do if you have this thing tick? I mean... There are two solutions. Either you treat it like we do it today, or like physics, phys uh, how do you say, phys physicists do it today. Like they don't, they don't do like one, two, three. They still do one, two. So those are the two options. Yeah. When one option doesn't work, it's the other that's left. Okay, fun. So Let, let's do this. This is will be the final question. Just a fun section. I'm gonna say a composer. You tell me if he's whole beat or not. 
Maybe they're all Hobbit. <laughs> so, but I'm going to ask 19th century ones because maybe, you know, maybe the later ones might not be Hobbit. Okay. So, Cherny. Cherny, yeah, Hobbit. Beethoven. 100%. Beethoven. Yeah, 100%. 100% Hobbit. Uh, Mozart. Didn't leave metronome marks. Was not invented yet. So, I shouldn't ask about the 18th century generally. We have metronome marks by Moschlis and Cherny and others on Mozart and their Hobbit. Okay. Um, list. Very few metronome marks, whole beat. Very late in his life, I haven't gone into those that he left, but certainly the first half of his career, whole beat. No um, discussion. The Paris Conservatory, very famous in the 19th century. A lot of major people came out of that. Were they trained in whole beat? All whole beat. No discussion. Really? All whole beat? No discussion. Like Alcan and, and, and that sort of thing. The whole beat, no discussion. How are we going to play Alcan? We have durations by Alcan, yeah. Incredible. I okay. Think, yeah. Um, the, let's go to the Russians now. So I guess the five and Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, whole beat. No discussion. Wow. <laughs> okay. Rachmaninoff lived into the 20th century. He heard Horowitz going crazy. What was he? Very, 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 very good question. We believe, but we are, that's an open door. We see evidence for Rachmaninoff to be a whole beat composer. He played his works faster, the acoustical recordings, faster than his metronome marks, but slower than single beat. His piano roll recordings, same issue as before. He signed off faster recordings. So, piano concerto, Alberto told me that, is recorded, is, uh, when we hear the piano concerto played by, Ravel, uh, by, by Rachmaninoff, we hear it half a tone higher than the score indicates. It was sped you know up. what happens when you when you speed up right. the recording and you have no digital. I mean, people will be freaking out, but there are <laughs> Rachmaninoff metronome marks that are just too good to be true. Yep. That like 16 repeated notes a second. I'm sorry, but nobody's going to do that. Right. Um, can I ask Debussy? Uh, we talked about the Paris Conservatory, but he's quite late. So what would you say about Debussy and Ravel? Same same thing. We have to research that, but I strongly convinced. It didn't leave much metronome marks, eh? but the ones we have are really, really fast. So I would say still whole beat. So this transition period of single beat to of whole beat to single beat is so interesting. It's a research topic on itself. But we first have to establish the assumption or the the awareness that whole beat was a concept, and from there you can go into the 20th century. Ravel, I saw one uh, recently, like a guy made a video against me. It was a long time ago, but I only saw it recently. He said, like, Ravel, they changed their mind. The Pavana, piano score, 1899. And I know it, it will be in the book as an open question. It's eight, it's quarter note 80, and then it's orchestral score is quarter note 40, uh, 54, much later. It's, yeah, isn't probably there, he changed from hobby to single beat. Isn't there an we interesting... Isn't there an interesting anecdote where Bolero was angry with a composer who, a uh, conductor who did his Bolero? To, he said, You're playing it too fast. And then the guy said, Look, I got to do it. It made a better performance or something like that. It's this weird story by uh, he was, Toscanini was playing too fast. He told, uh, as said Ravel, and he, Toscanini answered, like, be, you, you should be happy that I made something out of your music. <laughs> <laughs> but he may recorded the piece in 1936, so there's no discussion. He plays exactly in the metronome mark of, Chopin, of, of, of Ravel. I mean, I'm not going to say anything positive or negatively on that yep. time. The only thing I know, we have some very bizarre stories. Uh, Reger, Straube, they knew each other. Max Reger metronomized his music. Re Straube mm -hmm. edited it and published it again. Metronome marks ratio two to one. Eh? And they wow. didn't mm -hmm. even communicate about it. Uh, Puno has also made some remarks on Chopin metronome marks. We have editions of Karl Czerny by the Kunkel brothers, very famous in the United States, came from Germany. I mean, uh, Czerny's metronome mark, and then between brackets, the same tempo indication, but almost half as fast. I mean, we have, there definitely was something that people knew, but they didn't. Why? And the question would come like, why would Rachmaninoff play faster than his metronome marks? Because that would be the end. That would be the, the final question. Shell, and sell the sheet music. Way, the only way to answer that is like, <laughs> sell he sheet music. Yeah. As the pianist. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, he probably had to. <laughs> yeah. Or he wanted to. 
Or he gives us a metronome act like this is the ideal tempo of my music, but when I'm on stage, I'm the virtuoso pianist. I mean, we have to change our mind, our mindset, our perspective, and then go through all the letters and evidence again, and then you will, I'm sure, we'll see, we'll see the solution will be easy. Oh, yeah, it more. always needs to be easy. Uh, two more quick. Uh, Rimsky Korsakov and his student Stravinsky. Stravinsky, the things that we have looked into, and, and that's not so much, probably a single beat. Okay. And so his. Just a course of books, I, the few things I've seen um, have, a, have a huge direction to whole beat. Very interesting. Uh, I want to end off with Bach. So, Bach, how should, what's the tempo that people should play Bach in? There's no tempo markings. No tempo markings and no metronome marks and no pendulum indications. So the stupid guy didn't give us <laughs> anything. You always have to start from a kind of middle tempo, the tempo ordinario, which is second for normal normal time. But it's it's hard to say in a few words. I would say as an advice, when you play every kind of music, whenever you have the impression like this goes too fast for me to follow the notes, then slow down. And it will be surprise you when you do this for a while, like follow your, not your instinct, not your instinct in a way like I'm going to play like a professional pianist or musician. You follow your heart. You want to understand every note you're playing. You will end up in tempo very quickly that are very close to whole beat. It, I, I've seen this happen with a lot of musicians. This concept is not so strange. Those tempi are not like taken randomly. They are here. And you just have to open yourself for that. Certainly when you play Bach, certainly when you play Mom, actually when you play all kinds of music. Wonderful. Well, I think that is a great, great point to end on. Um, Wim, why don't you talk about any upcoming events you have, uh, projects uh, for the rest of the year? You talked about the book. Is there anything else you want to let my audience know uh, that's coming up for you? We are now in a period this year where we are going to release a lot of recordings on YouTube, also on digital streaming platforms, but also on physical releases. So we just uh, had a Kickstarter for Beethoven Fifth Symphony on vinyl disc and on CD. And we both were successful, even though the vinyl disc is pretty expensive. So you will see this year five or six more of these releases, and that will continue in time. So stay tuned, I would say. Um, there is, if you go to my channel, there's always a link to the email list. If you um, opt in for subscribe for the email list, you will certainly have all that information in your inbox whenever it comes. Well, Wim, I support your research. Uh, I just want to see more research and I wish more people would, would challenge you in a way that is to the facts. And I want to hear more. All I want to hear are more facts, more research. More, uh, what's that? That's a tough word. Philology. <laughs> Somebody told me. <laughs> just uh, interpreting the data, um, and that would be just so wonderful because I'm so interested. And uh, and uh, credit to you for for being for being out there, putting yourself out there, and trying to uh, ask tough questions that people nobody really wants to ask. Um, and I think really that's uh, you deserve a lot of credit for that. And uh, thank you for being on the show. I hope you had a good time, and uh, I hope to talk to you soon. Maybe when the book's released. Let's wait a while and then let's come back on and have another discussion on the reaction and uh, how it's going. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.
Thank you. 